So here's where we're at. We've collected an IID sample from some probability distribution, meaning our data values are all independent from one another. They're all coming from some common distribution. And we think we know what that probability distribution is. Maybe it's a normal distribution, or a Poisson distribution, or an exponential distribution. We just don't know what flavor of that distribution that we're dealing with. So we don't know the mu parameter of the normal that's dictating where the distribution peaks. We don't know what the lambda parameter is of the Poisson, or the lambda parameter of the exponential distribution. And what we'd like to do is we'd like to come up with something that we can measure from the data, some statistic that allows us to come up with a good guess for that unknown parameter. And so we know that there's going to be a few logical ways, potentially, that we can estimate what theta is from our sample. Potentially, we could use the sample average as a good guess for what theta is, or maybe the largest value of the data values that we've collected, or maybe something more sophisticated, like summing up all of the squared values of our collected data, and then dividing by the number that we have. And so we've discussed the maximum likelihood method of estimating parameters, and we've discussed the methods of moments method of coming up with an estimate for a parameter. And we've talked about, well, what separates these two methods? Which one is better? How do we even talk about the quality of an estimator? And so when we do talk about the quality of an estimator, we talk about three major quantities. We talk about the bias of that estimator. On average, how far away is the estimated value going to be away from that true parameter theta? We've talked about the variance of the estimator as well. So essentially, if we were to go and look at a bunch of different random samples, look at what the estimator comes back for each one of those, how spread out are those estimates? So we'd like to deal with a estimator that is relatively consistent from sample to sample. It's kind of trying to measure the exact same thing. It's a bad sign if our estimate can be all over the place. And we've combined those two measures together, the bias and the variance of the estimator, into the root mean squared error. Mean squared error, take the square root, root mean squared error, and that gives us a measure for the typical error that our estimation procedure makes when we're trying to guess what theta is from the data values that we've collected. And I think that's best illustrated by looking at a dartboard. So we could imagine that we have two methods, let's call them the red method and the green method for estimating theta, and each dot on this dartboard represents the estimated value of theta from a different random sample. And so what we see is that the green estimator is biased because on average, we kind of look where the center of the green estimators are. We see that we're kind of far away from the bullseye. But one thing the green estimator does have going for it is that it has a relatively low variance. If we compare the values of the estimator from one random sample to the next, there's not all that much variation. We're fairly consistent in what we're trying to estimate, and that's a plus. If we look at the red estimator, well, we find that it's unbiased. On average, we kind of look to see where the center of the estimates are for each of those red random samples. We're getting right close to the center of the bullseye. But a problem with the red estimator is that it has a fairly large variance. You know, the estimated value might be all over the place. Sometimes we're really close to the center of the dartboard. Sometimes we're really quite far away. And so that mean squared error was a way to combine these two ideas of bias and variance into a single number, square the bias, add the variance, and that's what we could use as the overall quality measure of our estimation procedure. Square root of that's the root mean squared error. So what really separates these two methods is their variance. How far off is the estimate likely to be from the true value of theta of that probability distribution? It turns out that the variance of the MLE is less than or equal to the variance of the methods of moments estimator. So in some sense, the maximum likelihood estimator for at least large samples is always going to be superior to the methods of moments estimator because typically its value is going to be closer to the true value of theta than the methods of moments estimator. And so this does beg the question, okay, we can talk about the MLE being better than the methods of moments estimator. Is there an estimator that's even better than the MLE? Can we find an unbiased estimator that has an even lower variance than the maximum likelihood estimator that gets typically closer to the true value of theta than theta hat of the MLE? 
Well, it turns out that the answer to this question is no, and this is all tied in to what's known as the Rao Kramer lower bound, which provides us the smallest possible variance of any unbiased estimator out there. So way back in the day, people sat down and said, all right, what is going to be the closest that any possible unbiased estimator can typically get to the truth? And so Rao and Kramer figured out this key result that the variance of any unbiased estimator, theta hat, has to be at least 1 over n times a quantity that's known as the Fisher information of the probability distribution. So remarkably, there actually is an expression that lets us know what the smallest possible variance is of any unbiased estimator. And we can go and we can check to see, well, have we found it? Or is there still room for improvement? Now, to evaluate that expression, we have to know, well, what is this Fisher information? The Fisher information is just the expected value of a very special function of x. So what is this very special function? Well, if we go and look at the second derivative with respect to theta of the logarithm of the formula for our probability distribution, that expected value, once we flip the sign, is what is defined as the Fisher information of the probability distribution. If you dive into information theory, it provides a reasonable measure of just how much information that a particular value of uh, the data actually contains about that unknown parameter theta. But for us, all we need to care about is that this is just an expected value of a function. So as a brief example, we could imagine dealing with the Poisson distribution, whose formula is equal to e to the minus theta times theta raised to the x over x factorial. Now we can ask well from alpha to take the second derivative of the log of our formula for the Poisson with respect to theta, and we would find that this is equal to minus x over theta squared. So the Fisher information asks us to find the expected value of this function, flip the sign, and that's what gives us our i of theta, that Fisher information. To get the expected value of that function, we just transcribe the formula for our function, minus x over theta squared, multiply that by the formula for the PMF of our Poisson, and since x is a discrete random variable, we'll take the sum of that expression over all possible values of x, from 0 up to infinity. And so we get out that the expected value of our function is minus 1 over theta, we flip the sign, and that's going to give us our Fisher information, 1 over theta. So now we know what the smallest possible variance is of any unbiased estimator for theta. What we can do is take 1 over n times the expression for the Fisher information, and that lets us know that the variance of any unbiased estimator is going to be at least equal to theta over n. So what is the variance of the MLE in this case? So we might remember that the MLE, the maximum likelihood estimator of Poisson random variable, is just the sample average. So we could ask, well, what is the variance of the sample average, the variance of our estimator? And in this case, we could write out our expression for what the sample average is. It's just 1 over n times the sum of all of the data values that we've collected. When we take the variance of some constant, like a times a random variable, we could take out that constant in front of the variance operator. We just have to square it. And so the variance of our estimator would just be 1 over n squared times the variance of the sum of all the data values that we've collected, x1 plus x2, etc. Now, because we're dealing with an IID sample, all of the x's are independent. The variance of a sum turns out to be just the sum of the variances. And the variance of a Poisson random variable also happens to be just the parameter itself, uh, theta in this case. So our expression for the variance of the MLE just works out to be 1 over n squared times the variance of the first data value that we've collected, which is theta, plus the variance of the second value that we've collected, also theta, n copies of theta all added up. We find that the variance of the MLE in this case is just theta over n, which equals to our Rao Kramer lower bound. So we know that our search for a good estimator is done. We found an unbiased estimator, which is just the sample average, and we found that the variance of that estimator reaches that Rao Kramer lower bound, so there aren't any other unbiased estimators out there that's going to typically get closer to the true value of theta than if we use the MLE, just the sample average in this case. And so in general, when we do talk about the quality of our estimators, you know, we want an unbiased estimator, we want it to have the lowest possible variance possible, that Rao Kramer lower bound tells us the smallest value that the variance can be, so we can talk about the efficiency 
of an estimator. Basically, what is the ratio of the Rao Kramer lower bound to the actual variance of our estimator? The highest the efficiency can be is one, 100%. And for any other estimator out there that doesn't quite reach that Rao Kramer lower bound, we'll find an efficiency that's less than one. And so here's the key bit of insight about maximum likelihood estimators. Our theta hat, when found with the maximum likelihood estimator procedure, is asymptotically efficient. So all that really means is that for very large sample sizes, as long as we have enough data, not only is the MLE basically unbiased, but of all unbiased estimators, it's going to be the one that's get, that gets closest to the true value of theta. And in fact, there aren't going to be any other estimators out there that do a better job. So when we're talking about large sample sizes, like we typically are in business analytics, we literally cannot do better than the MLE. It's basically going to be unbiased, and there's no other estimator out there that's going to get you closer, typically, to the true value of the parameter that you're trying to estimate. So with that in mind, with us really liking maximum likelihood estimation, we can ask some additional questions. So sure, we know the MLE typically gets closest to the true value of theta among all unbiased estimators, but how close does it really get? Can we come up with a measure for a standard error of the estimator that lets us know typically how far off our MLE is, our theta hat, from the true value of theta? And then can we do even better? Can we come up with a range of values of theta that seem plausible based on the data that we've collected? Can we come up with a confidence interval for theta based on our MLE? And the answers to both of these questions are yes, and that's what we'll be covering in this unit. <laughs> Squirrel. Ha, 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 ha.